I'm going to return to you, Pascal, because I want to ask you, I'm going to bring up both of your articles. Both of you have written really interesting articles. One that you wrote, Pascal, is called The Obsession with the Black-White Wealth Gap Protects the Elites, which I can't believe Newsweek let you write, <laughs> but they did. So tell us why you wrote that. I wrote that article as a frustration with the way in which Black political discourse had shifted into the belief that focusing on the racial wealth gap was A, something new, and B, that would be a transformative solution for the condition of the majority of Black people. Because I had realized by reading a lot of great left Black political scientists like uh, Cedric Johnson, like Adolf Reed, and Black political historians like Tory, Tory, Tory Reed, Preston <laughs> Smith, who has one of the best books. Probably. Um, on yeah. Chicago housing politics and how black elites were trying to use their position to negotiate racial disparities to work for them to the disadvantage of poor and working class black people and how becoming aware of that made me realize that this is the same hustle that has gone on in post civil rights black politics over and over again where believing that focusing on the disparity between Black people and white people mean that we're going to address all of Black people's problems. This is the simple reason why this is a con game. If you made the bottom 90% of Black people and the bottom 90% of white people totally equal in their wealth, totally equal, 77% of the racial wealth gap would still exist. That's a fact. Do you know why? Because the racial wealth gap is, is between the top 10% of whites and the top 10% of blacks. In other words, you're talking about black high hundred thousand heirs and maybe a couple of black millionaires and white multi-billionaires. While the majority of blacks and whites, though there is a wealth gap between blacks and whites, let's not deny that, let's not mitigate that, generally a pretty broke to poor working class. Below the 50% line for both blacks and whites, they're both, they're, you're basically arguing over a housing project or a trailer park. Where do you want to live? And so why is it uh, framed this way so frequently, would you say? It's framed this way so frequently because the discourse around the aspirations of black people in America since the civil rights era and unfortunately, since the death of the old left, are structured, even maybe going back to the old left, are structured so those same people who get the fat back and biscuits get to tell you what Black people need and want. Those same people like Al Sharpton, Joy Ann Reed, et cetera. So all of those neoliberal sh charlatans who are saying, Bernie Sanders is more racist than Hillary Clinton, who was telling you that your children should be locked up because they're totally degenerate. Right, and brought to heal, right? And brought to heal. <laughs> those same million, those same millionaire fat back and biscuits receiving Negroes, if you will, shape the discourse around black politics. And black politics is a captured politics. What does that mean? They are institutional mechanisms within black politics that explain why someone like a James Clyburn is able to marshal citizens to come out and vote for Joe Biden. Organizations like the, 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 the what we, we call the, the what Black Agenda Report refers to as the Black misleadership class, or what I like to call, or most Black political scientists call the Black political class. You have the traditional civil rights establishment, the Urban League, the NAACP, the traditional Black churches, the Black fraternities and sororities, of which one I am a member, you have of the Black Freemasons and secret societies and other organizations. Because people like Jim Clyburn has all of their leadership in a Rolodex, and he's able to take his fat back and biscuits patronage and get job, summer jobs for their teenagers, programs for their school, after-school luncheons, using that corporate, corporate finance largesse, he can call in that fat back and biscuits and they can be loyal enough that in exchange for that 
he will get them to come out and be like, come on now, support Joe Biden. Joe Biden. Does that mean that it's going to be that black politics is destined to follow, to follow that paradigm? No, because in the Chicago mayoral race, that didn't work. We just had a mayor who had much more progressive politics, much more in line with Bernie, comes out of the Chicago, Chicago Teachers Union, break the old guard black political machine in Chicago and won. All right, don't forget, this is a city that had uh, Barack Obama's homeboy in the mayorship just a couple of terms ago. Rahm Emanuel. Rahm Emanuel. Rahm Emanuel, yeah. Who covered up the killing of the uh, Kwame McDonald. Yeah, exactly. All right? So there are glimmers of hope. Right now, we're seeing the black political classes scrambling because they are invested so much in Joe Biden. They don't know where to go because they don't want to see this Bernie Sanders kind of and we shouldn't just say Bernie Sanders because it started before Sanders. It started with Occupy. It started with people realizing that they got screwed over after the 2008 crash. Yeah. It's a good shorthand, though. I mean, we could debate. I, like, I, where I, started, I'm but... one of those that starts with Sanders. I don't think yeah. Occupy leaves the same political footprint that 2016 leaves just because people, the more people feel comfortable. I, I, I've always given Sanders the credit for, for culminating that whole moment through an electoral political movement. Right. I, I wouldn't deny that. But what I'm saying is that the crash of 2008 creates an, un an unawareness in people that capitalism is not working. I would make the argument that we're still suffering the repercussions of the 2008 crash. Oh, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And you and I have private conversations about this as well, because we were different, you know, somewhat different people at that time as well, financially. Absolutely. But, you know, I, I think when we think Occupy and we try to put it in a certain place, we have to remember that people are all over the place politically Occupy. There's more, you know, Vax deniers in Occupy than there is socialists in Occupy, and uh, as as a as a kind of succinct movement, I don't think it does the same thing that Bernie Sanders does. And I don't say this; this is just an, an observational point. This isn't because I think one person is so wonderful, um, because you get uh, politicians out of it that you didn't get out of Occupy. That's a fair statement. Right. You, AOC can't happen without Bernie Sanders and the Internet. Some people would say that's a reason to condemn. Him. 